Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Henrietta Huldis, Chief Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs at The Walker. And on behalf of the curatorial team and the Department of Public Engagement, Learning and Impact, I am so delighted to welcome you all tonight um, to celebrate the opening of Pahua Harris' exhibition, Gakum Da, Flowers of the Sky. I'd like to start by noting that the name of our state, Minnesota Makoche, or Minnesota, means uh, the land where the waters reflect the sky in the Dakota language, and acknowledge that the Walker Art Center and the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden are located on the contemporary ancestral and traditional homelands of the Dakota people. And the site where we're all gathering on tonight was once an expanse of marshland and meadow that holds meaning for Dakota, Ojibwe, and indigenous people from other native nations who live in the community today. And I think this is an important reminder and grounding for tonight's conversation as Pa's new body of work is deeply invested in the land, the people who live on it and who work, who make a living off it. I want to extend special thanks to uh, this evening to all supporters, uh, without whom this exhibition and all the programs would not be possible. We're grateful to the Edward R. Bazinet Foundation for their key support of this show, and also want to acknowledge Northern Trust for their important sponsorship. And so a very warm welcome for our funders who are here with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, I hope that all of you have had or will have an opportunity to see Pa's exhibition, um, which features a new body of work she developed for The Walker. Um, the show will be on view here until January 22nd, so you can also come back. And if you want to see more of her work, you can come and visit our permanent collection galleries upstairs. We have some recent photographs of hers in Gallery 4 on view. So I'm so glad that Pa can be with us here tonight um, and talk a little bit more about the project, about her practice overall. And I know that she almost needs no introduction to everyone here. I know there's a lot of friends and family in the room. However, you will find biographical information on her as well as the other speakers in your program notes. Pa, we're so grateful for your generosity, for your collaboration, and for sharing your work. Thank you. And of course, I also want to acknowledge the incredible work of the curatorial team, my colleagues Victoria Sung, Associate Curator, and Matthew Bellar Miranda, Curatorial Fellow, who have worked with Pa over the last year or so to bring this uh, show to fruition and who I know are as excited as I am to share it with audiences from today on. So um, I also, I can't, I can't hand it over to them without thanking Megan Leafblad and Sarah Schultz, who organized tonight's event, in fact, organized all of our free um, summer, social, summer Social Free Thursday Nights event, events which will be on uh, view till uh, August, and I hope you that will check out our calendar and come back. After the talk, which will be a little, uh, will be about an hour long and will conclude with a short q and I hope you will all uh, join us for a, a reception up in Cargill Lounge with beverages and some special foods, dishes um, created by the Twin City chef, Yia Vang. So with now, without further ado, please welcome Papa Hare, Victoria Sum, and Matthew Villar Miranda. Thank you, Henrietta. Uh, my name is Victoria Sung, and I'm thrilled to be up here with my co-curator, Matthew Villar Miranda, and of course, Pa Hua Her. And I just want to say the energy in this room feels so incredible, and I think the warmth and um, the energy just speaks to these kind of communities of care and creativity that Pa has cultivated um, over the last you know decades. Um, so we are going to. Uh, be in conversation for about 45 minutes, uh, 40, to, 40 to 45 minutes, we'll say, and then we'll open it up for Q&A um, for 15 minutes. So if you have any questions that come up as we're talking, please you know, make note of them, and um, we'll have uh, mics running um, at the end of this. So we are going to jump right in. And I think um, when Pa, Matt, and I were talking, um, we thought it would be nice to give a little bit of an introduction maybe to Pa's practice for those of you who may not be as familiar with Pa's work. Um, and then we can dive really into the exhibition that's on view um, here at the Walker and that just opened today. Um, so the first question to Pa uh, is going to be um, how and when you first picked up your first camera. <laughs> So um, first and foremost, thank you to both Vicky and Matthew, and thank you, Henrietta, for 
such a beautiful introduction. And also thank you to everybody that's here. I feel uh, so, I was like, I was very nervous at the very beginning because I was like, oh my God, we have to fill out 300 uh, chairs. And so I just, I feel really loved. And so thank you all for taking the time out of uh, your busy schedule to come and to see the show and then to hear me talk. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, Vicky, to go back to your story. So to your question, um, I'd say that I picked up my first camera when I was maybe in the sixth grade. Um, I remember having um, at Frost Lake um, Elementary School in St. Paul, I remember this after school program um, and um, uh, Mr. Williams, that's his name, he uh, conduct, he had this after school program for um, uh, kids of color to, um, to, to, uh, to photograph. And that's where and how I think I fell in love with photography. But I would say that it was like way before that too, right? Um, and so, you know, when my parents first came here to the United States, they both worked um, day in and day out. And um, my dad, um, before he, um, uh, would uh, go to work. He would record these um, stories um, that then my sister and I would play to go to sleep um, and so that we could hear him tell us these stories. And I think like it's like my brain started like thinking about like photographs visually from those stories. Yeah. And I feel like you at one point told us this incredible story about um, when you saw photographs by Wing Young Hui uh, in the Twin Cities, and how maybe that kind of uh, gave you the confidence to uh, photograph your own community. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, I was in community college, and I was a class away from graduating with an associate's degree in paralegal studies at Invergrove Community College. And my professor, uh, Martin Springboard, he you know, I took this class with him. Um, Wing was having an exhibition here at the Walker. Um, Martin said, hey, look at this guy who's like making this body of work about Frogtown um, and you should look at this work. And so it started looking at the work and um, I think for me that was my introduction to thinking about photographing uh, my own community. Um, that was my introduction to like Hmong people um, like being photographed doing daily stuff, right? Something that I'd never seen before. And not only that, I was like seeing my family being like photographed, right? So like Monko was like photographed. There was this party that my grandmother was at and in the one of the photographs you can see her eating with like the uh, Hmong woman right and so it was this sort of introduction to um to Wing Young Huey's work that I realized that the kind of stories I wanted to tell or the types of photographs that I wanted to make um could be made or that like this is how they could potentially look like and so it was Wing Young Huey so did you know, I guess, from like very early on that you wanted to photograph the Hmong community here in the Twin Cities? Um, did you face any resistance to that or any challenges to that? How did, how did you think about that early on? So, I mean, I think that I have like an amazing family and like um, family unit um, that surrounds me, right? Because like, I think like my siblings and my parents were all like they had no idea what I was doing, but the fact that I wanted to photograph them, um, like they were okay with. And so I started photographing my family um, very early on. Um, I photographed um, uh, my parents, I photographed my brothers and my sisters, and then I started photographing like my close friends, my cousins. And so I was making these sort of like family photographs and you know I think I started doing that because it was like easy for me and there was like I was a it was proximity to accessibility right it was like super accessible um, and then I think in um, you know when I went to um, so I started making photographs among people um, but when I went to um, uh, 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 graduate school I was away from Hmong people, and I had I was like forced to make 
these photographs because we would have these um, critiques um, every five weeks, right? And so I had to produce work. And I was really, really, really bored of the work that I was producing in New Haven, right? And they were like deprived of like the community that I was photographing. And so what I would do is I would like, I remember talking to my partner, yeah, and going, oh, I wanna come home. And he would be like, okay, like tickets are really expensive, but sure. So he would buy me tickets and I would then come home every weekend and I would like make photographs. And it was like these photographs of like, of, of, of Minnesota, of the Twin Cities, that then was what I was showing in graduate school. And those were like, for me, the most exciting. And those were the ones that were um, like, that my professors and people that were sitting at the critique panels, um, that's what they were responding to, you know? And so th that for me just came, it just because of that, I just decided that um, as an artist, as, as a practice, um, I was going to continue to just sort of make work within my own community, within my own family. Um, you know, sometimes the work is, um, you know, um, very personal. Sometimes the work is about a current event that's happening within the Hmong community. Sometimes the work is about, you know, f family lores. Um, sometimes it's about stories that I've heard, you know, as a child. And so. It was really nice hearing about the origins of how you started your practice as something really deeply personal and interior and somewhat in a domestic space. And I think that um, the series that you have at the Walker in the permanent collection is called The Imaginative Landscape, um, which is a really interesting concept because I'm trying to understand at what point did your really personal interior space then become your artist practice or your public space and encapsulated in that phrase, imaginative landscape is both something really um, fantastical, like imagination, but something like deeply raw and real and based in reality and truth, which is the, uh, the idea of a landscape. And I, could, I think a good segue into the work that you've produced in this show. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about, um, I know that you've brought up how influential your grandmother was in starting your practice, but the relationship of the idea of an imaginary landscape and um, and your work with your grandmother. Yeah, yeah so uh, my um, maternal grandmother, who um, I was had a really, really close relationship with. Um, so just to sort of backtrack a little bit. So I was born in Laos, but I was not raised in Laos, right? And so um, I don't have any memories of what Laos looked like in 1982. Um, I don't have any, my memories of um, the refugee camps um, in Thailand um, are very like sparse, right? So like, you know, I have these like really f like faint memory of like being lost in the camp. I have memories of like having to go to the hospital and um, I had polio when I was a child and so getting my legs fixed. So there's like these like really sparse memory, but like I have like, if somebody said, what was Laos like in 1980? To the year that I was born, I would have no idea, and I would I wouldn't be able to tell you. But my grandmother, who um, I spent a lot of time with, I remember like she would come over every weekend, and um, on Fridays, and she would sleep over, and my sister Chua and I would fight over who gets to sleep with her because obviously we had these like twin beds, and we both couldn't sleep with her. And sometimes I would win, and every time that I won, I would you know, ask her, you know, what was Laos like? You know, how did you, how did you meet your, like, how did you meet grandpa? You know, how was dating like? And so she would give me these sort of very vivid memories of what it was like to like walk in the jungles or like the path to their garden or like what it was like to um, garden on the side of the mountain. And I would have these like memories of what I thought Laos would look like, right? And how, what Laos, looks like now and obviously I mean for me it's like this very luscious green jungle scape with like spirits like in the jungles with um with tigers and just really colorful in some ways right and so like that is my like that's the imaginative landscape for me right and in, in thinking about what Laos could potentially look like and that body of work that's up in five ways in 
um, is uh, is is an attempt to sort of like think about Laos in that way, right? It's just sort of a it's very much research based. It's collecting um, these um, th these like spaces. It's collecting these plants, thinking about who can be in these places, and so that's what the work is. Thank you. I mean, it's kind of dripping through the formalism of those images because you see what I imagine to be a natural bouquet, but they're actually silk flowers. Um, sometimes you'll see a portrait of someone, but then you'll see a little sheen of the photo studio backdrop behind them. And I think that's so key to a lot of your bodies of work is that you're working between artifice and reality and honoring both you know, in the image itself. Um, so, uh, so I'm wondering how this, then, establishing your earlier practice, um, if we could talk about the exhibition that's up, uh, starting with the title, yeah. which uh, is Pa Gom Du. Did I do that right? <laughs> Almost. Almost. <laughs> you got the first thank part you, right. Because it's, yeah. No, I'm a lifetime learner. I love the attempt. <laughs> But when I first heard you translate it, it f sounded very uncanny because it was flowers of the sky rather than in the sky. Um, and around the subject matter, for my background, I immediately associated it with um, counterculture, psychedelia, flowers raining from the sky. Um, and so I think that I learned so much about um, the lyricism and poeticism that's very much embedded you know, in the title itself. And that describes the relationship between Hmong language and land. So could you um, talk about the title? <laughs> yes, of course. Right, so, um, so, Pakondu is a phrase that I heard um, my parents using in like 2016, 2017. And I never understood that phrase because I always thought like, like I, I, I don't have any attachments to it, and so I had no idea what that phrase meant until I asked my mom, like, what do you mean? Like, because like my parents would, they would have these sort of conversations, and they would talk about an aunt or an uncle, and my, uh, you know, and so uh, we, w I would say like, where do they go? Because my parents would say they left, and so my dad would say, oh, um, lomu atia pa and then I would say, like, what? What does that mean? Right? So my dad would say, oh, they went to go cut flowers of the sky. And so I'd say, what does that mean? And so then I would have to ask for like a literal translation from my mom. So my mom would say, oh, that's that that's like another word for marijuana. And in Hmong, we already have a word for marijuana. It's sa, right? And so I would say like, why don't we just say sa? Why do we always have to, why do we have to say pa And so um, I, I, I never understood why, but I realize now that like, because so many folks, so much of, so many folks in my community um, are doing it, know people that do it, that's how they associate um, marijuana, um, right? And that's how they talk about it because I, I just feel like monk culture, you know, we would much rather be poetic than direct because we are, you know, I mean, I think it's also like a Minnesotan thing that we've taken on to, right? Um, <laughs> You know, and so I, you know, and so um, I, that's how, that's how I heard of, um, of, of, of the way in which um, marijuana is like spoken in the, in the Hmong um, language and also in the Hmong context, right? And so thinking about um, this body work that um, you all will see or maybe that you have seen already, um, you know, so the work was developed in 2020, right? And so right at the height of the pandemic or right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, I was also like as an artist and as a practicing artist, I was really looking for a way in which I could continue my practice, right? And so, um, you know, I was not able to photograph people anymore. And so I had to sort of really adjust and um, turn my camera somewhere else. And um, my uh, husband and I, we, um, we went to California to visit family down there, um, one uh, in the summer of 2020, and um, it was there that I just sort of saw this landscape that was really strange to me. And it was really strange to me because the ways in which like, um, like folks in my community were like living in this space, the way they like the way that they like build community in this space. Um, 
and you know just sort of like thinking about like this like um like going back to laos and like you know just like thinking about this i just sort of started researching and started making these photographs i just want to um quickly say that uh on the title bakondu there's an incredible um piece that kaoklia uh, yang wrote um on uh, mnartist.org. So uh, hopefully you can check that out after the talk. But just to give people maybe a sense of kind of what the exhibition experience is like, um, for those who may not have seen the gallery yet, uh, Pa has created an incredible uh, new body of work, three, I would say three different bodies of work. Um, the first of which is uh, these large scale landscapes um, that are shown in uh, a light box format. Um, so we'll talk about those. Um, and then the second body of work are these 16 uh, aerial photographs um, of uh, this Northern California um, landscape, the same landscape that she shows on the ground in the light boxes. And then the final um, piece is really this two channel video piece. And it's the first video, right, that you're showing um, in a public space. And it's a two channel video that um, is a version of Gatia. Is that right? Yeah. Gatia uh, Hmong song poetry, and it's a beautiful kind of call and response between these two individuals. Um, so maybe we should kind of just start, you know, one by one and go through. Um, and I think we should start with the the light boxes because they, you know, immediately draw your eye when you're when you enter the space. Um, but can you talk about your engagement, maybe with well, moving from let's say portraiture to landscape photography and specifically um, photography of this region? Yeah, so, um, you know, I um, have, I, I, I always tell people that I have this like really traditional and what I think is traditional like photograph, um, photography like upbringing, right? Like, so, I mean, I was taught by the best um, here in like here in the cities um, at MCAD. So I have this like sort of, you know, um, like photographic history of the, very first uh, photographers and what they were making, right? And so I'm thinking about um, um, the daguerreotypes, right? Um, you know, Carlton, Carlton Watkins, Timothy O'Sullivan, um, Enzo Adams, right? Um, Edward Weston, right? These these folks that um, made photographs of the, the the West, right? And they they made these like really beautiful, expansive um, photographs of of the landscapes of the West, um, in hopes and also to entice folks that were living in the East to like come to the West, right? Or to appreciate the grandeur of of of, of, of the West. And so, you know, I was really looking at those photographs and thinking about ways in which. You know, and thinking about the landscapes that I was making, you know, I'm I'm also really interested in um, like thinking about like um, like uh, like making these photographs as sort of like ways to like advertisement, right? So thinking about like um, what are some of the elements, uh, advertisement elements that are that that could be used to entice people, right? And for me, these sort of light boxes, right, that you see when you're at the mall. Um, that like uh, show uh, like people in apparel when you s you see these light boxes when you are um, walking through um, uh, the airport right and there are usually of these like amazing um, beaches right so if, for me it's about like um, like in, like seducing you in right so how can I seduce you in and for me it's um, the light boxes the light boxes does the seduction right yeah I think that. After, for preparing with the exhibition and seeing a flat image, it's nothing compared to actually see them illuminated. When you walk into the galleries, the primary light sources are the artworks themselves, and you're bathed in the light of this landscape and sort of washed over with the sounds of the kutsia. Um, so, and they're really uncanny in ways that are very different from what Ansel Adams was doing. Um, I think I've heard and read, you know, the F64 group of which Ansel Adams belongs to and like the Hudson River School or other um, landscape photographers be referred to as like art fraternities because they are male dominated often. <laughs> but and there's, there's a lot of generosity in the way that you, you kind of reference their compositions and the traditions, but you also subvert them. Sometimes when I'm looking at a landscape, I'm overtaken by how the trees seem to 
reach for the sky, or sometimes they're bending under the weight of, of a fence. Um, but I think that the uncanniness there is that you're always um, including some kind of mark of um, human presence. And that signals to me that I'm somewhat implicated like in that image and that I'm part of, you know, uh, of this entangled survival. So I was wondering uh, if you could talk about how you, you know, composed and chose each one of those shots that are in the gallery. Yeah, so, you know, I think like for me, the landscapes are really important, right? Because like, because um, um, for me, there's like this history, right? I mean, there's so many layers to the landscape or to these ideas that I'm thinking about, right? And so, you know, the landscape for me, like the, the landscape historically in like, in the history of California has this history, right? And then like on top of that, like within recent years, like Hmong people have made this area home. And so there's like this history there too. And then also Hmong people also has this like history with like given and like turning over land that is deemed like uninhabitable or, uh, you know, like Hmong people have this history. And so like, I'm like really interested in like this sort of like three different like layers of like history. Um, and then also like for me, like, you know, I, I wanna be, um, I wanna be um, uh, sensitive to like the people that are working there because obviously we know that like the majority of the Hmong people that have um, uh, land there and that are, are producing or cultivating marijuana are done illegally, right? And so there's like these like so many like different layers and like they like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be illegal, but also like the state of California makes it really hard for them to like make it legal, right? Because so like there's like all of these like different layers of 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 issues and like also like I uh, like levels of like trust and um, like I also want to be like sensitive to like my community and so h the question that I have when I'm making these photographs is. Um, like, can I make a photograph that elicits um, these um, types of questions, right? Because there's like environmental questions that are at play. There are these sort of social justice questions that are at play with the landscape. And then there's this like, um, like historical um, context that like is like part of that land. And so, um, when I'm making these photographs and when I'm thinking about these photographs and also deciding what to, like, what to, like, when I'm making these edits, those are questions that I'm thinking about, right? I, I mean, like, I don't know, like, sometimes they work, sometimes they, they don't. I'm hoping that they, like, for the most part work, you know, because I'm thinking about those things and because the name, also, like, the name elicits such a, like, strong, um, uh, like, um, um uh like um uh like monk people i mean i just like i just on facebook and you know just that name like gets people riled up you know and so i i'm hoping that that can like play into like the like the like the viewing of like these images i'm wondering if it might be helpful actually if we just take a little bit of a step back and um maybe spell out for everyone a little um, about these histories and current events that we're alluding to. Yeah. And I know in particular, the green rush is something that you know, you've know you referenced quite a bit. So right. do you wanna talk about maybe how you actually landed on this uh, area to photograph? Yeah, yeah so um, in like uh, 2018, uh, like early 2019, there was this New York Times article that came out um, about the green rush and it was, very specifically talking about Siskiyou County in California, Northern California. And um, there was, um, so like, talked about like the history of that space, but then also like the, his like, and then um, it was like referencing um, like Hmong folks um, and our history, right? And so like, you know, we have this, uh, like we have this history, uh, 1940s, between the 1940s and the 1960s, in Laos, Hmong people were sort of a major um, component of um, of open um, cultivation. And so the um, article uh, talks, like, 
connects the two, right? And so it's, it, it was like, okay, like these people, uh, you know, were opium cultivation, and here they are in America, and they're like using their agricultural like knowledge to like then um, also like cultivate marijuana, and it's sort of this like s cycle, right? And so I was like really, really fascinated by that too, because like I don't think that I had like made that connection. And then also the ways in which they were talking about um, the surveillance, right? So the local government, you know, so the article suggested that um, like the local government, uh, it was really hard for the local government to sort of penetrate this very specific area. And the only way that they were able to sort of see what was happening was through these like Google Earth images. And so I was like, okay, let me go on Google Earth and let me see what's happening. And so like when you go on Google Earth and then this very specific um, triangle, which is called the Emerald Triangle, um, you uh, you start to see, right? You, you can see how, and, and you can see where um, marijuana is like being cultivated um, because there's like these like little singular plants that are there. And I was like really fascinated by like, sort of like that way, like this way of looking Right, and then also um, when I went to uh, California and started making photographs, I wasn't so much interested in the marijuana cultivation. Um, you know, I'm like as I, I I am interested in the the marijuana cultivation, but I'm not interested in like and showing you that because I feel like maybe you know that already. You know what that looks like already. But I was really fascinated by the landscape because the landscape of this area is actually really um, uh, like, it's like, it's it's like it's 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 rugged and it's like really rough, right? Um, it's uh, the dirt is really uh, sandy. Um, the rocks that are there are like uh, are, are like volcano rocks, lava rocks. Um, you know uh, the water is um, uh, the water that comes out of there is uh, really salty, and so everything that like requires you to grow. Um, or to cultivate marijuana, you have to like implant it in. So like, I mean, you have to like get it brought in, right? So if you want water, you have to like hire a water guy and he will bring in water. If you want um, soil, you have to like buy a truckload of soil and have the guy bring it in, right? So everything that you are using to cultivate marijuana, you have to like go out and you have to like outsource it. And the, the land does nothing for you. The only thing that the land does for you is it like, it gives you like the foundation to put all these things on, that's it, you know? And so I was like really fascinated by that, um, by that landscape, um, you know? And so I was like thinking about that when I was like making the photographs and I realized that I'm like, I get really excited when I talk about this. Um, and so I just have to like calm myself down. Because <laughs> I can go on and on and on. Well, we have time. So. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I love in what you were just saying is how you were talking about you know, the connection between opium growing and the poppy flower and uh, cannabis cultivation in California and how there's this really interesting linkage and nostalgia maybe that this new period, this green rush is evoking in many of the farmers in Northern California. And I feel like this might be a nice way to you know, start talking about the song poetry that you include um, in the exhibition. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, the Gutsia, right? And so, um, you know, Gutsia is traditionally, I, I'm, I'm not the like the best person to talk about Gutsia, like I'm not, and like and how it like came to be in our tradition in like in the Hmong culture, but I will like say what I know, right? And so I think like historically Gutsia, um, ha like uh, the way, uh, in the, like the way it's like uh, to compare it to and something that's in English that maybe we can all understand or like in, in, in the American culture is like poems, right? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of singing uh, that uses your vocals and, uh, so, and it's uh, v like poetic, right? And so like sometimes you, it requires you to really listen 
to the kutsias to know what they are singing um, and what they are saying and what this means, right? Um, but the, it, it, it also is like very tonal, like, right? So like you can you hear the tones and you can guess and you can uh, listen and you can sort of figure out whether or not it's like a sad song or if it's a happy song, right? And so, um, and so, uh, the Kutsia is um, a two-channel uh, video. Um, one was made uh, in um, Laos in January of this year. I wasn't able to go to Laos, so um, there was a man that I connected with when I would, when I went there, and he was a filmmaker, and so I had um, I I you know connected with him, and you know we was there was a lot of Zoom calls and a lot of uh, FaceTiming and, you know, to, to, to get the things, that the shot that I needed, right? But essentially this man, um, uh, the singer, sings this really beautiful song about um, wanting to come to America and, like, wanting to experience, like, the American dream, right? And it's a singer that has been here in America and that has worked in, like, the um the the uh, marijuana fields in like California, right? And the and then uh there's a woman who um oh no I love that music <laughs> so great um <laughs> but um so the woman who um uh uh is um uh from the United States from Minnesota. She talks about, um, you know, um, uh, the 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 American War and being torn from her village and having to move to America and experiencing all of the riches of of of, of America, but also like longing to go back home to Laos, right? And so this sort of call and response um, is like the, maybe the best way that I can. Um, I can explain it, you know. But what I really love about that um, is that um, I love that I don't have to be like in that space. Like I love that I'm uh, like I can be outside of that space, and like just their calling like um, invites me into like this space, right? Um, and that for me is like really, really good. Yeah, it feels really good. Yeah, I uh, I always appreciate through your work how you call attention to the ways that um, you know Hmong has had a really recent written language, and there's still no sort of nation state to conjure around. Um, so for me, being a Filipinx person, I could always say I'm Filipino because there is a country called the Philippines. But somehow um, Hmong communities and through language pass this knowledge and create a homeland through um, their poetry, the Kutsia. There is an amazing, and I think that what's amazing is that, you know, the man is in Laos, the woman is in northern Minneapolis. We're talking about a, another community diaspora on the other side of the country in California, but it's all um, sort of really beautifully woven in a singular space that you're sharing with all of us. So <laughs> grateful for it. and. Um, there is a moment where, even though the singers aren't directly singing to each other, they echo each other's phrases and um, and remarks. And in some ways, the way that I think about song lyrics or cliches, it seems like they're quoting or responding to each other from someone who's orally experiencing it. So I was wondering if you can talk about some of the shared language between the speakers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so like in both of them, um, they say this phrase, and it's in Hmong, it's, um, I want to make sure I get it right. My Hmong isn't all that great, too, and so I want to make sure I get it right. And so it's like, it's it, he, the the man and the woman, in some respect, will say, like, Lucia sa the shi lu hai chi tao, right? And so it's this phrase that says, my heart wishes, but my mouth cannot speak. Right, and th they say that both in um, in both of the in the kutsia. And I just I just thought, like, how beautiful to to say that about America and to say that about Laos. Right, there's something really beautiful about that. Yeah, and it's like it gets says uh, it gets said like over and over again. So, 
The other thing that I loved when you had explained Gatia to me and Matt previously was how you talked about how each individual performer actually has a lot of agency in how they craft their own um, song. And so you said it in a great way. You were like, there's a beginning and an end and there's no rules in between. <laughs> But each person, you know, was able to pick up kind of, as, as Matt alluded to, you know, this really interesting kind of almost a resonance or repetition um, in that feeling of longing, um, which is really special in the work. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about Gutsia is that you can just say, okay, I want you to sing about, you know, um, losing a loved one. And they'll, like, they'll start and then they'll sing and then they'll cry and then they'll like and then they'll stop and it's sort of like there's like this the prompt is like is there right and then all you need is the prompt you know um yeah and so like the best Gutsia singers can sing just about anything and make anybody weep and like cry yeah <laughs> we did catch pa shedding some tears in the gallery <laughs> Yes, it was really sad. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think this uh, narrative element that we've been kind of uh, dancing around a little bit is really interesting to maybe spend a couple minutes unpacking. So, Pa, you mentioned how growing up, you know, your dad and maybe your uh, maternal grandmother um, would play kind of uh, folk tales or stories as you were, you know, going to sleep. Um, We've talked about also kind of Hmong story cloths as also, you know, being very narrative in nature um, and telling uh, very personal stories about uh, the escape from Laos to uh, refugee camps in Thailand. Um, and then there's, of course, yeah, the narrative element in, in Gatia as well. So I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about um, how that inflects maybe the entire exhibition um, outside of the two videos, too. Yeah, I mean, I think that like um, storytelling is something that is um, and has always been like um, embedded in our history, right? So like um, the idea is that we don't have a written history and that our history is very oral and it gets passed down, right? And so I think about that when I'm making work, you know, um, you know, I think about what it means to like visually. Um, uh, tell somebody something, right? Um, you know, like, like what kind of information can I give you without giving you the thing that I want to give you? Um, what are these prompts, right? And so, like, um, you know, and so what I what I love about this exhibition, if you have not gone to it, is you enter with this beautiful, um, like, uh, uh, cloth right of Mount Shasta and like in the forefront are these op like larger than life like opium flowers you know and then you like it just it, it and then you like it it um you know you hear the song and it like it it seduces you in you know and then like here are these like big light boxes right that has this sort of really beautiful illumination and then you're like again further seduce right into the space um and i think like i say that because i think that like for me like as an artist um like whose practice is based in like photography like i've always like how can i like seduce you without like seducing you <laughs> you know and I think about that a lot when I'm making work. <laughs> and so like, and so I think that this for me, this exhibition, any exhibition is sort of an attempt for me, right, to like do that. And so like I do it, I try to do it over and over again. And like the, like it gets, I think for me, like it gets like better and better and better and better. Um, yeah, and so like, I, I don't know, like I hope that answers your question. So I actually think this is the time when we need to um, open up to Q&A from all of you. So uh, we'll have a couple mics, I think, running down. Um, if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand um, and we'll get you a mic. And I see one person in the center. And then I think maybe one thing I'll just say while we're waiting is, Pa has a tendency to make everything seem easy. <laughs> and even when you were saying, for example, that your, um, 
you know, engagement with your community, it was easy for you, and that's why you went in that direction initially. I just want to underscore kind of the radicality of what Pa is doing um, with her photographs, and you know, it really rings a bell for me, and Matt will be familiar too with this story um, of this uh, Filipino American artist, Carlos Villa, who in the 60s, you know, he went to uh, school in San Francisco and he went to, he has a story of how he went to one of his instructors and he said, you know, where can I learn um, Filipino American art history? And his instructor said, there is none. And he set out to really create it and craft it, you know, for himself and for future generations. And I feel so much that, you know, Pa, in documenting your own community, you're really doing the same thing. So I just want to underscore that because I think she makes everything seem so easy. <laughs> so I think there was a question. Do we? Okay, great. Can never. Oh, yep. Come on. <laughs> um, firstly, congratulations, Pa. I, I am really excited that this is here. And I was curious, having seen the light boxes at Mung Town Market as a part of the Midway Contemporary Art offsite, viewing what about the work shifts and changes for you based upon how they live in a location. So markedly, Mung Town Market is a very different place than the Walker. And so I'm just curious if you could speak, if you're willing and able to, about that. Yeah, you know, so when I first started thinking about um, the light boxes, um, I was doing research. They were really expensive to make. Like, I couldn't make them as an artist. And so when Midway came to me, Midway would say, they said, you know, what would you like to do? We were thinking about this offsite project. You know, I jumped at the, 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 I jumped right at the, like, just like, I was like, light boxes. And I want to put them at Mung Town Market because I've, like, would just love to put work out there. And, and so, you know, I say, I've said this to a couple of people, but I love those images there I love that they're so unassuming I love that like you could sit so close to them I love that you can touch them I love that kids are able to touch them I love that you can eat your food and then like have really greasy hands and like touch them and nobody <laughs> nobody tells you that you can't touch them and so there's like there's like that element of like uh, of the, those light boxes that I that I love right so they fit right in they feel like any old um, Asian restaurants, uh, Chinese restaurants that like I've been to that have um, these sort of light boxes. So there's this element that I really like about that work. Um, and, and, and I don't really think that like anything um, in has changed, right? I'm still very much thinking about the work as being like these sort of like, um, like um, advertisement, right? Uh, like what are ways in which um, like, how can I seduce, like, how can I seduce you? You know, how does those light boxes, like, how can those light boxes at Monktown Market, like, seduce people to, like, come and, like, have a meal or, like, maybe sit, right? And, you know, what I love about the Monktown Market um, light boxes, and I, I go there every weekend for um, for lunch, I, I, um, is I love how, like, I just, I love the interaction that, like, um, like, like th that is like that happens with like that work. Um, I know that like the work here, like obviously, like you can't touch it, and like you can't go up there and like eat in that space, <laughs> right? And I understand, like, but I also I'm so aware of like the kind of different context, like what it means to like have work in a museum, and then also what it means to like have work in these sort of like open spaces. You know, um, and I think that like it it operates differently for different viewers. You know, my hope is that the folks that uh, the folks that do come to the museums will like be excited about those works at Monktown Market, and they can make a trip to Monktown Market and experience how amazing um, the market is on the weekends and, and and weekdays, but mostly weekends. You know, and I also and my and my hope is that the folks there can also come here, right? Um, and so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions?
I was just interested with um, some of the photographs that I was just seeing here with the older men yeah. in um, their military uniforms, particularly, you know, their American U.S. military uniform. Just if you could speak a little bit to that. Um, I was the, the found that particularly interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then also one more thing is just, I just wondered, especially with COVID and everything we've had going on in terms of you being out in the communities, just, um, I think there's so much culturally going on, right, with within the United States right now, how that mm-hmm. you're viewing that through your work or in your community, in the Hmong community. Two, two questions, sorry. Yeah, so I guess I'll I'll speak on like uh, the like the later question and then I, like go back to the first question. And so um, like this work or the work that is like up in the gallery, like I feel like was made like in response to COVID, right? And so like you know I like historically have always been a portrait photographer, love making portraits of people. And so when um, COVID happened, it was really hard to like go out and to make work. And, uh, you know, I didn't feel comfortable, you know, like calling somebody and say, can I photograph you? You know, um, can I photograph you? And so what I, so like the work in California is sort of um, like uh, the answer to like, um, uh, like not being like not being able to photograph um, of, of people, right? And so I think that like I think that like yes, um, the pandemic started in 2020, and we are still in a pandemic, right? Um, and so like that is still very much fresh in my mind. Um, you know, I'm still having a really hard time going out and making photographs of people. I want to be mindful of like all the things that are happening, right? Um, and so um, and so I hope that answers your question. And I, I mean, I, you know, I know that like the Hmong community especially has been really hit hard with, um, with COVID deaths, you know. Um, uh, so, but to answer your first question, so like the um, the older Hmong men, like the one that you see, um, uh, so that, that body of work is um, called Attention. Um, and it's a body of work of of Hmong, of older Hmong men who fought during the war, um, the Vietnam War, but are not um, are recognized by the United States government, right? And so uh, they're, uh, the way in which they are recognized is they're, I think they're considered allies of the United States military. They're not um, um, veterans. Uh, for a lot of these men, I would say 99% of these men, they want to be veterans, right? And so there are real efforts efforts in both on a local, a state, and a federal level to like get these men um, federally and uh, like locally recognized as veterans so that they can also um, uh, be, ac- they can also have access to these veterans rights, right? Um, but for me, I was really interested in the fact that like, um, that they, the one, right? So when I photographed this, when I made these photographs, the Stolen Valors Act was really fresh, Right, uh, Obama had just signed it. People were really worried, especially within my community, because they would uh, wear these uniforms out to like these um, uh, like community outings, family outings, social outings, right? And so people were really scared about like whether or not they would get charged um, with the federal crime, right? Um, and but also like the uniforms that they were wearing were also uniforms that were not like given to them by the United States government. They had to go out and they had to use their own money to. Uh, buy these uniforms either on the internet or in military surplus stores you know they like bought their own pins and they gave themselves you know their own pins and they gave themselves their own uh, you know um, military ratings right and so I was very much interested in sort of this culture and then also like as a photographer well how can I photograph these men in a way that speaks to this and I think for me my the answer for that was well to photograph them in a way um, that like speaks to like this tradition of military portraits that have been made in the United States you know and this is like an attempt to do that so so we have time for one last question before we two more and then uh, we'll go to the rece- reception hi 
Hello. Thank you so much for your inspiration and your exhibit. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm super excited to go through it. And I did go to see the Mungtown one. But uh, my question is, for the Gutierre portion, was it hard to like translate it and understand it? And who helped you translate it if you um, had those language barriers? OK, so I think that that's like an amazing question uh, because I've been thinking about that a lot. You know, I think there was like a lot of resistance from me as the artist, right? So like, I like, I did not want, I don't, so there aren't subtitles on the Gutsia, right? And so um, the Gutsia is all in Hmong. There are no subtitles. There's like a QR code. And so if you want to, like, you want to know what the English translation is, you can take your phone and you can read the, um, the um, translation. But that for me was really important that, like, you know, and, and that, like, there weren't any, um, like, subtitles, right? And that, like, and that, like, folks who wanted to understand it, like, they would have to work just a little bit harder to, like, to get it. Right, and so that for me was like really important. Um, you know, I'm also like a person that like is not well versed in Gutsia, and so I have to listen to it a couple of times in order to like understand like what exactly is being said. But you know, I was like, you know, I I gave the prompt right, and so I know that generally this work is about you know, this longing for Laos and for the men, the work is generally about the sort of longing for America, right? And so there is, so there is that, right? But if you wanna know, if you wanna know what they're saying, you have to like do a little bit of work. And I like that there's like, that, 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 that like, um, you know, for my, um, for my like um, non Hmong Hmong folks, I like that there's like work that needs like the that like that I'm not like doing the work for you, and that you have to do the work. So, yeah. Thanks, Pa. That was um, incredible to hear you speak about your work. Um, you mentioned. Um, the knowledge and background on the historic American landscape photographers of the American West. And Matthew uh, mentioned how you very elegantly subverted that tradition. And I was curious if the new topographic photographers um, were in your mind at all. Because when I look at the photographs, and I did pop into the gallery um, before the talk, um, the the ecological aspects are seem really much in the the foreground and i was just curious if i was reading that your intent there yeah um absolutely right um i just got a book during the pandemic i think it's called american geography and it's um it was like a it's it's a collection of 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 American photographers who are photographing the West. And, you know, I, I looked at that book quite extensively and just really thinking about, like, the form, like, formally how that work looks, you know, um, and then, but also, like, I'm very aware of some of the issues that are, like, you know, that are happening, environmental issues that are, like, important, right? Uh, you know, we all know that there's a huge route uh, there's been a drought for a really long time, but also like there's been, you know, that there's a huge drought um, out west. Uh, we know that the water, the rivers are depleting. We know that the dams are, you know, r running low, right? So yes, I am thinking all about, I'm thinking about all of those things. All right, so unless there's one last question, uh, all right, one last question here, and then we will head up to the reception. My sister's yelling at me. <laughs> Hi, Pahoa. Um, I'm not an artist, and I know very little about art and photography. But the images that you have on the screen just bring me back to, like, Hmong 1980s. So I just wanted to say that a lot of fond memories of the photos. And I think it hits Hmong Americans a little bit differently as we're looking at your photography. 
Um, and so uh, I want to say thank you for making us visible. And um, I am so proud of you. Thank you. And I love the fact that so many Hmong families brought their young children here. My nieces are here. My nephews are here. And so you make us proud. Oh, I don't have a question. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that is an amazing note to end on. And um, thank you again, Pa. Thank you, Matt. And we will, the three of us and all of you, hopefully will be heading up these stairs to the reception, um, which is in Cargill Lounge. And one thing I want uh, to make a note of is that your ticket that you got um, to enter the cinema will be the ticket that you can use to get a drink. So please hold on to it um, because it will come in handy. So thank you so much for being here and we look forward to seeing you up there. Yeah, thank you.